most of you have been on before, but I'd just like to start off by saying that the format is I've got a short presentation that I'm going to go through on the, this week's topic, which is the photographer, John Sharkovsky, as opposed to the critic and curator. And uh, after I go through my presentation, then I'll open it up to everyone to discuss further. Um, and so if I say anything that makes you have a question about something, just hold it off to the end, and then we can all talk about it later uh, versus trying to interrupt in the middle. So I'm going to start off by sharing my screen and going to Lightroom, which everyone should see now. Great. Uh, so yes, the topic for this week is the photographer, John Tchaikovsky. Now, you could make many different presentations and discussions about uh, John, and you could take it from so many different angles because of you know his critical importance in the history of photography, especially in this range between 1962 and 1991 when he was at MoMA as the main head curator. But I thought it'd be more interesting to not talk about that really that era of his life, but talk more about him as the photographer and how you know how did he wind up even getting to MoMA? Why did he get chosen as the to be in that position, right? Um, so what I did today was to sit down and I looked through the four books. There's uh, the idea of Louis Sullivan, the face of Minnesota. Mr. Bristol's Barn, and then John Sharkovsky ph photographs, which was the SF MoMA book that went along with his uh, retrospective. And, uh, you know, there's something really to be gained by diving back into work that you think you already know. I sat down, I was probably looked at all four of those books for several hours today, looking for which ones to take pictures of. And uh, I was listening to uh, Nusrat Fatih Ali Khan and just going through it and it was actually quite powerful to remember, you know, things that I thought I knew and then I forgot about and then the connections that I was making between things that I hadn't thought to do otherwise. So what I'm gonna be showing you today isn't gonna be nearly as powerful as the experience I had this morning, but I just thought it would be maybe encouraging you to go back, maybe not John Sharkovsky, but to go back to some other body of work that you think you understand and uh, see where you can go with it, right? Um, uh, before I get into him, I just want to really quickly t cover my relationship with him. I only met John twice. Both of them were at book signings. The first one was kind of bittersweet. I, um, the, the copy John Sharkovsky photographs had just come out and he was having a book signing at um, ICP, the ICP location that was near Times Square. And I got there early, like maybe half an hour before the event and I waited and no one, he finally got set up. He, no one else was in line. I was first. I got my book signed and I was chatting with them for a while. I asked if I was a photographer, that sort of thing. And but then after, I don't know, like five or six minutes, he like looked around me. And he's like, isn't there anybody else here? Like, you know, it was it was a little deflating. But uh, I met him once more at another book signing for when Tom Roma's book In Prison Air came out and he was there signing because he wrote the intro to it. But uh, I see that Yola's on and maybe Yoav will be on too later and both of them got to go up. I just missed while I was at Columbia the year before the entire photo three class went up to his farm and got to photograph and so I missed out on all of that. So like many people, my relationship to him is mostly through his writing, right? So uh, I wasn't even aware that um, you know, I wasn't aware of his great influence. It's like when you find out later that the same person produced a bunch of music that you love or, you know, that all these records came out of Motown or something where he was such a pivotal role. But I was reading uh, one of the Atje books and his description of Atje's uh, tree, like a, a, the Frenchman's relationship to his tree. And it suddenly really made me want to dive further in. And uh, but there's another coincidence that I thought was funny, which is uh, John, which is pi he's pictured here and smoking the cigarette with his glasses on. He was born in 1925 in Ashland, Wisconsin. And in 1970, I don't know, five or six, seven, somewhere in that range, I moved to Clam Lake, Wisconsin. I was in second grade and I was Ashland, Wisconsin was the next big town it was the only big town that we used to go to. 
And um, I looked up the statistics and when he was born, the population was like 11,000 people, small little town on the edge of Lake Superior. And uh, by the time I got there in the 70s, it had dropped down to 9,000 people. So it gotten even smaller. So it's definitely this like Midwestern small town aesthetic that kind of drew, uh, drove uh, him in his early life. This is a photograph of him returning to the local college in Ashland where he taught uh, literature for a while. And after being getting the appointment at MoMA, uh, they brought him back and he's being interviewed by, this is 1963, I believe, They're, he's being interviewed by uh, college students there about you know how he got off to the big city. So that was kind of interesting. Um, but uh, before, you know, bef while he was in school, uh, I found this quote from him saying that uh, the part of the reason why he went, went off to college and studied art history is he thought it'd be a good idea to, he wanted to make well-made pictures to look at the history of photography and the history of other people who had made photographs. And he wound up being handed a copy of, uh, or told to buy a copy of Walker Evans, uh, the uh, American Photographs, which he completely didn't get at all, which is kind of humorous. Um, he said uh, it was all, all facts and no art. Um, and what really resonated with him was uh, 50 photographs, Edward Weston, 50 photographs, and Edward Weston's California in the West. And this picture that he took in his backyard in Ashland of his uh, dog, Matthew Brady, uh, for the name should resonate with some of you, um, very much influenced by the, the work of Weston and this photograph too, I thought uh, from early work before uh, he worked on the Louis Sullivan stuff, very much influenced by that kind of, uh, I mean, there's a Weston photograph of grain silos, of course, but he also, when he was at working uh, at the Walker Arts Center, he was looking at all this uh, New York School of Abstract Painting that they were bringing in. And I think uh, the connection was made with this photograph and some of that work of thinking about about those sorts of things. But um, when he was teaching, he, th he thought it'd be a good idea to uh, go and make some photographs of these Louis Sullivan buildings. And um, that was sort of the first inclination of this idea of a project. And so even though he had just gotten this kind of good job in Minneapolis working at the Walker Art Center and he was the staff photographer there and he was actually contributing writing to the catalogs and photographing uh, utilitarian items like the plain, talking about the plain beauty of things and photographing spoons and forks and knives, you know, things that Evans later was doing for Fortune magazine. He decided to, to leave that, give it all up, and he took a job uh, in Buffalo, and I know Yola's here so we can talk about Buffalo as well, but um, he took this job uh, in Buffalo, gave up like the security of the Walker Art Center, and goes to the Albright School uh, in Buffalo, and um, part of the reason why is he was just enamored with Louis Sullivan and really wanted to go see that um, uh, the Prudential building there in Buffalo. So uh, a friend of his said, okay, before you go, you got to read Louis Sullivan's um, kindergarten uh, chats, which I have not read, but maybe someone on here has, but it's basically the sort of uh, master talking to the young student of uh, Louis Sullivan, giving all of his principles of what he thinks about form and art and design and everything for, for architecture. And this really resonated with uh, John very much. And uh, so even after a couple of years, he really wanted to keep working on this project. Uh, here's the two editions of the idea of Louis Sullivan. And um, so a lot of people think that this book came out of his Guggenheim, I mean, the book did, but that the work came, like he got a Guggenheim and started working on it. But he already moved to Buffalo to start photographing Sullivan, the Sullivan building. And then he upped and moved to Chicago. Uh, I think it was in like two years later, he'd barely been in Buffalo. And he's like, all right, leaving, going to Chicago because there's more Louis Sullivan buildings there. And while he was working on this project, he met uh, Aaron Siskin, he met Harry Callahan. He already was starting to get, um, uh, you know, tied into the photographic community there. And he was showing some of the work he had already started to do of these buildings of the of Louis Sullivan. And that's when he decided he was looking for a way to move it further. And he wound up getting uh, applied for and received a Guggenheim Fellowship. Now, when I looked at the the letters and writings that he did back at that time, he was writing to Evans he was showing this work, Steichen had seen this work. And so I'm not really sure who was 
giving out the Guggenheims in 1955, 1956, there was a very good chance it was either Evans, who was definitely doing it in the 60s, or it could have been Steichen, which kind of makes sense since uh, he wound up taking over his job at MoMA. So this work, you know, very much resonates definitely in Evans's wheelhouse, of course, and I could see Steichen uh, being very interested in it as well. And if you look at other architectural, you know, books and things from the time, everyone was just showing the photographs of the buildings as their own pristine thing with no context around them. And from reading the kindergarten chats and thinking about Sullivan's real interest in how buildings lived out their lives, he was making these photographs, which, you know, some of these look like they could be Harry Callahan photographs. Some of them look like street photography. He was often giving context to things. Uh, I mean, this could be a Friedlander photograph for later with the advertising in the center. So there was definitely this modernist take on it. And the, the book was received as that kind of a thing. When uh, they put the book together and it got out in the world, it did make a name for him. Uh, with later in about like a year later, the uh, Aperture did a whole issue dedicated to uh, architectural photography. And they have a quote from Tchaikovsky in there talking about Louis Sullivan. So it, it, was, uh, it, it made a big impact, just this work alone. And as it turned out, um, he, he was able to show these prints to Frank Lloyd Wright. He went by his office and uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was blown away by them. And of course, who worked for Sullivan for years. And so that alone kind of got, got him going. This is from the technical uh, notes at the back of the book, which I thought was interesting. I wrote, in photography as elsewhere, there are no technical problems, only technical solutions. The problem itself always is the non-technical one of discovery and understanding. Throughout this work, the attempt has been to allow the discovery of the subject to dictate photographic technique. Neither architectural nor, nor photographic preconceptions, quote unquote ideas, have been allowed precedence over the perception, the experience of the eye and mind when faced by the subject fact. I put that in there only because these are kind of ideas, of course, that later come out in his other writings. And this is uh, the rest of this technical explana explanation is about the four by five camera he used, which lenses, a roll of flex a little bit, which they're a gram paper, but he snuck that in there, which I thought uh, was interesting. Here's an ad from the New York Times at the time. <laughs> Uh, just to give it context, uh, you know, this is, and there the idea of Louis Sullivan is being advertised in the New York Times. Um, there's also kind of funny this Minnesota Gothic book because this ties right into Minnesota. Um, the woman who was the woman who was the uh, University of Minnesota uh, publishing uh, director. I have her name, but of course it just skipped away from me. Um, she was working, they were working at the last minute, finishing up the Louis Sullivan book. And she mentioned to him that the Minnesota Centennial was coming up in two years in uh, 1958 and that they really wanted to have a book or something to go along with it. So even though there was only two years until it needed to be out, he agreed to go ahead and jump into the project. And it's worth reading some of his back and forth with her where they talk about keeping independence and not letting the the people from the uh, Centennial um, Committee have any influence over what kind of photographs he was making. But that's this book, The Face of Minnesota. That's the original cover, which I think is terrible, unlike the original Louis Sullivan cover, which I think is much better than the later one. This, uh, I think, is superior. This version came out in 2008. Sadly, while they were working on doing the updated copy, uh, John had his stroke and died in uh, July of 2007, so he never saw uh, the next version actually get published, but was working with them on, on the version of it. And um, well, I think another interesting thing about this book is these kind of survey sort of books, Face of Minnesota, I'm sure we've all seen going at yard sales, you'll see a book like, you know, uh, an annual of 1960s or something, something, and they're usually quite dreadful and, and probably don't have a really a single good photograph in them. And, you know, John took on the kind of thing that you might expect you would do here where there's a mix of all of these, you'll see some of the subject matter I picked out, there's a mix of all these things that he's trying to get the breadth and the width of the state and all the different things that happen there. Starts off with these 
um, these huge rocks that have been pushed in through the glacier and talking about how Minnesota was shaped by the glaciers, but then going through industry, going through all these sorts of things. But, and, and there are some like silly pictures in here, which I didn't reproduce. So like some color ones of some ducks and some things like that. But in general, he, I mean, for two years work, he really dives in there. There's like uh, so many different things that he goes after, uh, which I thought was pretty amazing. And there's some sly stuff in here too. Like here's a, this is a, not a spread, but one page revealing the other. So talking about the native community in Minnesota, then you switch to the very next page and there's this kind of like 1950s hipster woman standing in front of her, the store front Indian there, please do not touch. Um, and like I said, there's there's a lot of great spreads actually in this book uh, too. And I wanted to point out this photograph, which much later when we look at the stuff that he did around his uh, hometown and what he's, I'm sorry, not his, his house in Chatham, that there's a real connection between that country work and the stuff that he did here uh, in Minnesota. The thing that I also find astounding is this book, um, which you would think, oh, it's just, you know, local interest, you know, 100 year centenary of Minnesota, wound up being on the New York Times bestseller list for eight weeks. So this, again, got a huge audience, even more so than the Sullivan book that, you know, so many people saw this. Um, and here's a, here's a quote from Frank Lloyd Wright, actually from uh, uh, another book, but I thought it was appropriate here. Uh, another section in the book. And why is any cow, red, black, or white, always in just the right place for a picture in any landscape? Like a cypress tree in Italy, she is never wrongly placed. Her outlines quiet down so well into whatever contours surround her. A group of her in the landscape is enchantment. <laughs> okay, Frank Lloyd Wright. And uh, so there's, a, there's definitely several cow pictures mixed into the book as well. And I should have talked about this as well with the Louis Sullivan book that always John was including writing. So in all three of the books uh, that are this, not the retrospective, it's all about pairing the photographs with the writing. I thought a lot about Wright Morris when I was looking at this work, not just because of the mid uh, Midwest kind of connection, but also this use of language, especially Mr. Bristol's Barn, uh, which we're going to get to. And, uh, you know, of course, you know, we got, I see Robert Adams, you can see a lot of other influences in this work that, that influences on John, but stuff that he would probably be looking for uh, later, right? And, uh, you know, as I said, in face of Minnesota, some of them are, are less uh, interesting than others. Some, I mean, also for the time period, I just love this guy in his hat with the rowboat going out. There's a lot of little nuances and things about uh, the world, but there's also these hints at the kind of photography that John was had an appetite for. I mean, I could see in this photograph on the right with these women looking in the window, you know, there's Friedlander, Winogrand. Uh, there's some portraits earlier on that certainly reminded me of Arvis and others. And, um, and you know, and then there's also sort of like that general reportage covering of things as well. Love this spread in the book with those two. Just her and her dress and that and that cow versus this guy with that monster. A lot of great spreads through here. And I also, this was on the section about art and art in Minnesota. Again, the language is very important in the book, so I'm leaving all of that out. You'd have to go back and look at this, but thinking about the Louis Sullivan book and then this facade, like the kind of humble nature of it was kind of sweet. There are also color plates in this book, and I would say for the most part, they're all pretty terrible. And I wondered if they were, if the publisher like pushed him to include some color work, but I thought this was interesting. This photograph is in Face of Minnesota, and this photograph is in the idea of Louis Sullivan. Obviously the same building just uh, went back and photographed it in color to be in this book. Again, got access to like, there's several surgery photographs, lots of stuff from industry and, uh, you know, kind of 4-H. And thinking about, you know, like I said, coming from Ashland and John's background, all of this stuff I think was right in his uh, area of like interest, that kind of things that he was uh, looking for, right? Some great pairings. 
I mean, got to think about Friedlander's photographs of work and photographing uh, the factory workers working on those Cray computers. I mean, this right in line with that, right? Uh, now there's a technical note at the end of this book too, and um, I'll skip through a couple sections of it, but I just wanna point out that again, we've got like this stuff about what film he used and the ectochrome and all this other stuff. But then he talks about, and this harkens back to what we were talking about on the, when we were talking about the cameras on the other photo topic and when we talked about digital versus analog. Um, he talks here about uh, this idea of like, what was the ISO, how much speed did he have for the bi wide variety of fo photos in this book. And uh, he says that my own picture making failures can seldom be blamed on inadequate film speed. And he goes on to talk about how the wet plate photographers were able to do all these sorts of things. And then uh, talking about design principles and uh, you know what stuff in the academy is telling you how to do the sorts of things. And then he goes on to say, the work of men like Brady and Jackson and O'Sullivan possessed clarity because the photographers knew what they wanted, that they had to know. The technique was far too unwieldy to allow shooting by whim. In contrast, today's photographic technique allows such facility that the photographer must consciously discipline his shooting if his eyes and mind are to retain or regain mastery over his equipment. To learn to photograph purposely, to be less like a sponge and more like a snare, will be very difficult today when the photographer has almost no technical limitations to help him. But I think that this is his real problem. When he combines the flexibility of today's technique with the purposeful intent that the earlier photographers knew, then photography will become a mature and responsible language. Again, this is kind of hilarious because it's 1958, uh, but um, also just thinking of those things that later come out in all of the writings that he did at MoMA, that, that's already in there, right? I also found there was this uh, review in Aperture uh, for the face of Minnesota, five bucks, 24 color illustrations, 179 black and white ones. I think this is minor white writing because I don't think anyone else was really writing reviews for Aperture at the time. But uh, they, they write, while his writing has improved, improved since the idea of Louis Sullivan, because they had mentioned, they reviewed that as well. While his writing has improved, he is still more at home with the, the visual medium. Because so few photographers can write at all, we can be patient with one who is trying to work with words and pictures together. His color is not equal to his black and white. For a variety of reasons, several of the full page color pictures are poor in every respect. I would have to agree <laughs> with that one. Um, so he's finishing up uh, this project. And uh, in that process, he winds up getting in touch with a lot of um, uh, people who are in, uh, thinking about preservation of the land and thinking about man's impact on the land. And uh, he then, fin as he's finishing up, applies for his second Guggenheim, which he receives. And it's to uh, go work on um, this section in uh, Ontario. Let's see, we're at Western Ontario, Great Lake, the Quetico Superior Wilderness. And he's working on this, gets the Guggenheim, starts working on it, and then gets the job offer for MoMA. So this photograph, which was made in 1961, or it might've been early, late, uh, early 62, was pretty much the last photograph that he made while working on that. He spent a lot of time out in this wilderness lake area with canoes portaging over vast areas of land trying to get in. And um, uh, it was during, while he was making this last photograph, that's when he decided that sure enough, he was going to take the job at MoMA. So I believe this is the only photograph that he turned into the Guggenheim committee in sort of satisfaction of receiving the grant, that second grant. And then he winds up at MoMA. So I, again, I'm not really gonna talk about the MoMA years at all, but I thought I would just send, uh, show a couple of photographs of John at MoMA or around that time. Of course, one of the benefits of being at the prestigious museum at the time was a lot of photographers would come and photograph you, right? So there's many photographs of John from this era, from 62 to 91. Here's Jerome Liebling, here's Cortege, uh, Avedon, and of course, a bunch from Friedlander. That's Gary Winogrand in the foreground photographing John in the background and this photograph by Lee. Another photograph by Lee, 60, you know, 73 or 74, so like 10 years after being there. 
And this is John up at his uh, house uh, in New York, which we'll be talking about as we get into Mr. Bristol's barn. And uh, during that whole time, he didn't try to promote any of his own photographs, didn't you know, exhibit, didn't know books, and of course, stopped photographing, which is one of the things I wanted to talk about today was this idea for people who teach or people give themselves over to something you know, larger than themselves, like being the curator at MoMA, where you give it up and then try to take it up later in life. And uh, I've heard from people that were very close to John, uh, Tom Roma and others, that uh, he had a lot of regrets for that period of time and a lot of regrets that, you know, the photography stopped for him and that later in life really wanted to be known as a photographer. So uh, with that being said, and he gets out in 91, um, he spends a lot more time up in uh, his house upstate. Now this house, um, was bought, he and his wife bought it, I think in 67, I think, or 60, not too long after, 69, not too long after they got to um, uh, New York, they found this old farmhouse up there in Chatham, New York, and uh, they, he spent a lot of time up there. He also became obsessed with apples, and there's a lot of photographs later of apples, and dove into apples almost as much as photography, like talking with people about how to breed them and do all these sorts of things. But this book, again, as I said earlier, reminded really the most of um, that connection with Wright Morris about the text and the photographs being so important together. And so uh, as the title of the book says, Mr. Bristol's Barn, which is the barn on his property, with excerpts from Mr. Blinn's diary. So Mr. Blinn, was uh, another farmer that lived about four miles from where John's, um, uh, John's farm is at the same time that uh, the, Mr. Blinn and uh, Mr. Bristol were farming. So they would have known each other uh, with no doubt. And he's pairing this, these diary entries with photographs from uh, this barn that was on John's property, which is uh, this, uh, you know, barns were at the time that were like the most high-tech thing on a farm, right? So the house might be like just put together with basic materials and might fall apart after X number of years, but the barns are really built to last. And uh, they used, you know, the best uh, technology that they could possibly do for putting these things together. And because of that, they have all this history built into them and there's all these markings and kind of recordings of them. And so there is a bit of a, the photographs I would say are more kind of romantic and matter of fact and showing parts of it, but the text and the diaries are kind of heart-wrenching. Um, they're all about how damn hard it is to be a farmer and how, it, how difficult it is to try to make any money out of it. Usually the guy is writing right after they get back from church. And then there's a number of heartbreaking kind of written accounts of bad health, the wife getting sick, getting sick again. And uh, one thing I couldn't help but think about, um, and I think gives context to the parts of the diary that John left in is, well, there's this photograph of mother being scratched into the side of the barn, but there's also this account of uh, their baby daughter being born several months premature, and this is an 1860, I think, 1860, three months premature baby, then they think the baby's gonna be all right, and then less than a week later, uh, the baby dies. And, uh, you know, John is survived by two daughters, but I th think, you know, it's in his obituary, but a lot of people don't really think about or talk about the fact that he also had a son who died when he was just two years old. So I think there's definitely a connection in thinking about the hardships and thinking about uh, that death of that baby and the decision to put that in here and just, you know, thinking about those kind of connections that people have across time with the architectural record and everything else being uh, thrown in. So uh, it's a sweet little book. It's tiny. Uh, I can hold it up later if people haven't seen it. And it's very much, it's kind of, uh, it's not so much about the photographs as it is about this connection between them, the writing, and uh, what it must, must have been like to eke out that living out there. I was also reminded of Robert Frost being the kind of failed gentleman farmer and John writing to his father asking, 
how much how much land would you have to have to have supported the two horses that they would have had to have before they got the you know John Deere tractor or whatever the tractor brand was. So this is also this guy generational connection and thinking about Bess and Minnie, the two horses and their stalls, and thinking about these sorts of things. So that was the only, that was the last project Don, uh, John did as like a finished body of work. I, I heard he was photograph he was wanting to photograph cows upstate and other things. Uh, before he had a stroke, but also right before, like two, a couple years right before his death, uh, SF MoMA, mostly Sandy Phillips, Sandra Phillips, the curator, put together this uh, exhibition which traveled and this monograph, which is, like I said, this is how I showed up to get my signature for this book. And uh, it has early work before um, the idea of Louis Sullivan, it has some of the photographs from that second Guggenheim around these lakes, which have a very different feel than I think either of the other bodies of work. And then it also includes, starting in the 90s, John would go on these trips with uh, uh, Richard Benson and Lee and John Childs. They would go uh, almost always to the West in Arizona and places like that. And uh, I think a lot of drinking happened and a lot of other things. He's trying to work with a four by five camera and. Uh, um, I know Tom Roma tells a, a hilarious story about him pulling out his dark slide and the film going flying in the air. So he, he talks about all the technical failures and issues he has. Um, but, and he was making these uh, diptychs, triptychs, and kind of like work with these sorts of things. But you can definitely see that the same kind of sensibility back from the work he was making in the 50s was still there, the same sort of interest in, in the kind of things that he was looking at. So in some ways, he really stayed true to that, those interests and uh, what he was going to photograph the whole time. Uh, these are some photographs from the apple orchard on his land. There's several from these apple orchards, like the same tree getting set up and then later when the apples are coming in. Here's a photograph uh, right towards the end of his life sitting on the front porch there. And um, I thought it'd be good to just, I'll leave off with this sort of photograph, um, is to talk about, well, I have this quote from the end of his obituary, which was in the New York Times, which was, uh, when asked by a reporter how it felt to exhibit his own photographs finally, knowing they would be measured against his curatorial legacy, he became circumspect. As an artist, quote, you look at other people's work and figure out how it can be useful to you, end quote, he said. I'm content that a lot of these pictures are going to be interesting for other photographers of talent and ambition, he said, and that's all you want. Um, so I think there's, other than just talking about, you know, the legacy part of it and, and, and this idea of what does it mean to to give it up for all those periods of years and try to go back to it. There's also this idea of maybe of being typecast in a way. I mean, John certainly made many friends and people wanted to be his friend because they were hoping that, you know, he would give them the seal of approval and get or give them a show at MoMA, et cetera, et cetera. You know, he had so much power in that position. But a lot of people also hated him because he didn't like their work or he, they didn't get what they hoped they would get out of it. And uh, I'm sure after he left MoMA that there was also this kind of feeling of, you know, trying to rejoin the ranks and everything else, right? So um, I think there was a lot of bitterness that got in there, but it's not in the work, which I thought was kind of interesting. So yeah, he died at 81 years old, complications from the stroke. Um, as I said, my timing was kind of poor because uh, if I'd gone to, to Columbia one year earlier, I would have been able to go out and meet him and be on his farm more. But um, I think it's interesting that there's two legacies. There's this legacy of these three bodies of work and the, uh, which are very much bodies of work and uh, encapsulated. Those books are not monographs about how great John Tchaikovsky is. They're about Louis Sullivan, they're about Minnesota, and they're about this idea of uh, this part of upstate New York with those diary entries. Um, so I think it's, uh, there's that legacy. And then of course, you know, all of the books and all the writing and everything else that you can come to. Um, so without, uh, without beating it into the ground, hopefully. Um, the, la oh, the last thing I wanted to mention from reading the, some of the accounts is when he's talking about 
those travels that they would make with Benson and all those guys, they went down to New Me they went down to Mexico, Mexico City, came back with nothing. And uh, one of the quotes was he had in there was, "One should work in a neighborhood where one knows what the symbols mean." So that also relates back to our conversation where you were talking about, um, uh, we we're talking about traveling and photographing last week, right? So John's one of those characters that is so entwined that you could either either by pushing against him and talking about what he what he overlooked and didn't show, or talking about you know how you came to it because of reading his writings or uh, uh, being influenced by the people that he did push, and of course you know new there's new photography and putting those things together, and of course. Uh, uh, Lee Friedlander, Gary Winogrand, Dean Arbus. I mean, that's his championshiping of those guys. It's on and on and on. But I think there's something to be said about to just uh, also looking at those photographs that he did and and thinking about that trajectory he was on and that decision to uh, ostensibly walk away and take on this position at MoMA, right? All right, that's enough from me. So I'll open it up for anyone who wants to uh, comment or talk about their their thoughts on John or his photographs or Louis Sullivan or any of the rest or uh, etc. So uh, don't forget, you have to unmute yourself. Or remain silent. Uh, Ted. Thanks for that. Those, those are really great. I, I hadn't looked at his work that much. And um, he's so overpowered by his presence during his tenure at MoMA. But um, I had seen the Louis Sullivan photographs. The photograph on the cover of that book is the Wainwright building in St. Louis, where I grew up. Um, so, so I know the building. Um, and I had a few. I had one memorable interaction with Sharkowski right after he left MoMA. He came into k and camera where I was working and he had, he had that battered first edition of Ansel Adams, the print, in his hand and he was looking for raw chemicals to make Amidol, um, so, of which were not uh, available. I mean, they were available, but not through not, not off the shelf at the camera store, um, and, and it was he was it was the middle of the afternoon. He was visibly drunk, um, which was an interesting uh, first uh, interaction with him. And the other thing is uh, maybe some other people were there, but he, he gave a lecture once at APAD on Ansel Adams. Um, and he, he prefaced it by saying uh, that he was there to, to rescue the reputation of Ansel Adams as the Smokey the Bear of American photography. And um, proceeded to give a slideshow, and he had all the slides in the projector upside down and backwards. So he was like stopping, pulling them out, putting them back in. It was, it was, it was, it was comical. And, um, uh, anyway, I, I really enjoyed looking at those photographs. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I I didn't mention Adams, which because um, after he left uh, being the curator at MoMA, of course, uh, John was involved in that book, um, is it Ansel Adams 100 or 100 or something. I forget the exact title, but it's his really trying to like bring back uh, Ansel Adams to be considered as a serious artist. And of course, he does talk about holding on to those uh, copies of the camera, the print and everything else. And uh, I think you could make some parallels. I mean, there's certainly, there's nothing sexy really about John's work when you look at that. Certainly nothing from, uh, you know, that has that kind of um, a more modern kind of sensibility to it, other than perhaps the Louis Sullivan work. And even then, you know, like I said, now, certainly not. And so in some ways, I could see a parallel between how people might think about John's work and how they might think about Ansel Adams, as far as if you put him in a compartment somewhere, sure. about the kind of work it is, right? Um, let's see, uh, Yoav or Yola, do either one of you want to talk about the experience you got to go to go up to uh, photograph on his farm and uh, walk around with eight by 10 view cameras and see the apple orchards or? Well, I'll add one, uh, thank you by the way, Kai, it was such 
extra, uh, maybe also because the work is so meditative, what a beautiful presentation. So thank you for that. I'll add one anecdote that I think that I remember John shared when we went to his farm, uh, but I, th I feel like I have heard it multiple times. So I think it was one of his signature anecdotes, but apparently when he had received the offer from the MoMA and he was still photographing, I, I think in Wisconsin, uh, or you know, he he was talking to someone and uh, back in his community there, and he explained. Uh, so he was tell, you know told the story that that uh, he was like, okay, so I explained to him what I would be. He was like, what is a curator? Okay, well, this is what I'm going to be doing. What is the MoMA? It's in New York. This is the kind of institution that this is. And so then the the guy uh, responded. Uh, he said, okay, well, so let me see if I have this correctly. So, so it sounds as if you'll be uh, trading in your hunting rifle for a game warden's permit. So that oh. was the story. And he told this to us when we visited him. Uh, you know, this was already in the years when he had gone back. To, uh, uh, you, you know, what year was it? To, yeah, 2005. But of course, he was then photographing. But the way, uh, but that story seems to have meant so much to him that you know, then he had his hunting rifle again, and like those kind of old world values about you know, almost like you know, something about like the law. You know, who am I? Uh, like, am I am I the enforcer of the rules, or am I? you know, the person who's on the ground breaking the rules or discovering them afresh. Um, yeah, so uh, I wanted to say that. And, and then as far as being, uh, being on his property, I don't know that I would have that, you know, that much to, to add from the actual experience of being there, except that um, maybe, uh, you know, that, that it was really very rustic and somehow i think you know for i was a young photographer at the time first year in the graduate program but it, it we we saw this john that was like very kind of sweet and affable with tom and intimate and 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 it like, did, didn't seem very heroic perhaps and uh um you know and all of these uh, columbia students including undergraduates were running around his property photographing what you know each other and whatever they wanted it was a very cold very rainy day but uh yeah i i think i i don't know how much we understood of what what it all meant like i hadn't seen that that book then but i had read about it um in a uh, double take uh, those pictures from the barn had appeared in double take magazine did you i don't know if you you ever saw that that's another interesting study because that, that that was the venture that that he had with um tom and helen but um yeah so i don't know if you have what would would want to add anything oh the last point i wanted to make is that uh, about buffalo I, I didn't didn't know he ever lived in Buffalo, but a uh, funny thing is, at, at least right now, there's only one Louis Sullivan building in Buffalo, which is a really beautiful, uh, uh, it's called the Guarantee Building, and I don't know if there were ever more, but there is a whole heck of a lot of Frank Lloyd Wright architecture in Buffalo. Yeah, the, the, that building is, it used to be called the Prudential Building, now it's That's called right. that, so it's the same building, and that yeah. was... One of the things that attracted him to go there or take that job apparently is... yeah but it's a kind of it's amazing to move somewhere for for one building oh and you had mentioned the albright I, perhaps there was an albright school there's an albright knox gallery which is a very uh uh kind of you know neoclassic uh uh really like the, i guess the star cultural attraction of the city but i'll i'll have to look into that more yeah, that's the same one. It's been there since I looked it up today. It's been there since 18 something another. And so, yeah. And maybe we could even talk about this connection to the 19th century, which I think um, John certainly felt a connection to. And if uh, the thing I also didn't mention about the diary entries in Mr. Bristol's barn is it's going along about the hardships and the commercial thing, the death in the family. And then it all of a sudden switches over to the Civil War starting up. So it's like, you know, all of that stuff is kind of mixed in there and that kind of 19th century uh, American concerns are certainly a thread that, that continues throughout, right? 
Uh, who else wants to add something? Jeffrey, why don't Jeffrey James, you want to add something? You got to unmute yourself. Uh, we can't hear you. There you go. Is that good? Yes. Am I in? Fantastic. Okay. Um, good to see you. So, so, hi. Yeah, I'm calling that Toronto. Let's all establish ourselves. And I seem to have, I've known, I've known, I knew him for a long time. And I was a sort of a nobody. And, and the first thing I noticed about him was he was extremely courteous and um, a, a gracious man and with very good manners um, and, and kind of open and relaxed. And it's, um, I think I'd, I'd written a, a piece about Ache, um in a little, little, little publication out of Edmonton and he liked it and he actually offered me a job in the early 70s when I was in Montreal. I was a, a writer and editor at Time magazine and he took me to lunch in his club, the Century Club. He said, come and join this candy factory before you're told. And I, I, I would have loved, loved to have done that, but I was, uh, there were a lot of reasons why I didn't, but the main one was I was completely unfit for the job and I never saw myself in that game. But here's the thing, he, 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 he believed in lunch as well. As you notice, um, lunch was usually a bottle of Chablis and soft shell crab. And you go back to the museum and he would pull out the prints he'd been talking about. But when I had lunch with him, he always talked about a book that I should read. He said, Jeffrey, um, the Ways and Traditions of Waterfowl, uh, A.J. Hochbaum, uh, Manitoba Delta Wildlife Foundation. You have to read it. You know, so. <laughs> So, so I never did read it, um, uh, and then, but, but I did actually find the book. I found it in a used bookstore, and I bought it, and I, and I read it. And then many years later, when John uh, had the show in San Francisco, they phoned me up and said, would you be on the panel? And I said, well, about John, I said, I don't really know John's photographs. I have the Sullivan book, which I love, but I have the shitty offset second edition, right? And they said, no, we'd like you to come. So I. You know, I kind of prepared myself, but um, but I I got this. I think the book is that is kind of the key to John. That's why he likes it so much because um, Hochbaum was the uh, 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 ornithological version of John Sarkovsky. He was a man with no academic credentials, um, acute powers of observation and empirical observation. And he was an artist. He did beautiful drawings of the, it's how the Canada geese get back to Canada from Mexico and how they navigate. It's a brilliant book. And, and, and like John too, he was a bit of a pariah in the academic world, you see. So, so but it's funny. So, 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 but I, I was wondering, I, you know, I, when, I, when, I, when he kept talking about the book, I, I asked Lee, Lee Friedland, I said, Lee, why is, he, why is he always recommending this book by A.E. Hochbaum? You know, because he thinks I'm Canadian, I'm interested in wildfowl. And Lee said, no, no, he's always recommending books by people with two first initials. Which <laughs> <laughs> okay. is a classic. Yeah. Lee, Lee once. Anyway, yeah. Uh, anyway, so anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll make, anyway, yeah. you, you made a few. A terrific thing, a point about the words and the pictures, you know, and um, uh, and Wright Morris. And then I'll pass you on another thing which I find very interesting. I'm trying to write a piece about Walker Evans, which will get me into a lot of trouble um, because it's not that normal hagiography. But um, George Orwell reviewed um, uh, Wright Morris's, I've forgotten which one it was, and, and now let us praise famous men in the Times Literary Supplement in the 50s. It was in, in a, um, an anthology of experimental writing out of America. And he was kind of underwhelmed by, he said, you know, um, uh, James Agee's reportage and, you know, Walker Evans's, you know, documentary photographs. And he said, Wright Morris, um, uh, very interesting the way he uses his captions is they're not really that much of anything, but this particular form is very interesting and could be developed. So anyway, I'll leave that thought with you. But Kai, also you did a beautiful presentation and I, I learned a lot, you know. Thank you. Thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, before I like, move on to someone else, I just want to point out in this book, there's a letter that John writes to Jeffrey and amongst other things he says, 
So Jeffrey, if it has been your ambition in life to deceive people and persuade them to go to God forsaken places, uh, it searches ineffable <laughs> virtuous qualities, I guess you have succeeded. So I, he was thinking about Canada at that point as well. So yeah, you know. there's, a fun, there's one funny story about that and, and very revealing of John. When that book came out, somebody, I, I think Tom Rome said, oh, Jeffrey, there's a letter from John to you in the book. It's an excerpt from the letter. I said, oh, God, I'd forgotten about it. Um, and and I, I, I realized I, I can't, I don't know whether I have it. My archive's not great. He had it. Why did he have it? A carbon copy mm. of a letter. He took himself seriously, right? You write a letter, you compose a letter, you keep a copy. And, and I, I think the thing you said, it was very interesting about when he was a curator and, and he gave an interview, I don't know if you ever saw it in the Massachusetts Review. Um, and he, he, he sort of said it was a very conscious decision that when he became the curator, he was going to give up photography. He gave it up completely. And you know, I know curators in America, lesser curators, and they have a drawer full of uh, well-thumbed prints, like a greasy deck of cards that they will pull out the slightest, you know, provocation. I think, I think it was a very, very principled stand. And I think, I think you're right. I think he did, I think he had many regrets, especially when everybody was coming around and asking about Eggleston, you know, yeah, much later, he definitely, when people asked him about Eggleston, he'd always push them off towards Friedlander and say, forget yeah, Eggleston. It would be like Man Ray getting annoyed when everyone's coming around to talk about Ache. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, Rob Steinberg, it looked like you had some, something you wanted to add? No. Oh, okay, I thought I saw you moving. Oddly, oddly enough, um, I did, uh, you know, a, a total sidebar is just to remind everyone if they haven't, there's free money for from your government for you. Uh, if you haven't applied for unemployment, they're quite liberal, not under the state rules, but under the Fed rules, they're $600 plus a week if you've been at all effective and it's very easy to get. So if you haven't applied, do so. Ah, well there. They're in Canada. <laughs> practical, practical advice. Uh, Yoav, you unmuted. Did you have something to add? Yeah, I, I remember when I went with, uh, with Viola and a couple of others in Palm and to East Chatham in New York, and I, I mostly remember how nervous I was actually before, because, you know, I had uh, looking at photographs since I was in my early 20s, and that seemed to be like a seminal text for me. And then going to meet him, for, well, actually, it was not the first time, because Tom took me to a talk at MoMA before then. But going to his house, I don't remember much of the conversation, frankly. I was just sitting there trying to get over my fear and finally ask him if I may photograph him. Um, and eventually I managed to stick, you know, a 120 on a 4x5, you know, a couple of feet away from him. And I made a photograph that I was, uh, uh, that was kind of a sign for me that I'm ready to touch glory in some way. <laughs> oh boy! Yeah, yeah. It was uh, it was really memorable. That's like 15 years ago, I think. Yeah, it would have been uh, 2006, spring 2006. Six, right, 14 years ago. I was already a year out of Colombia, and and Yella was there, and Yaniv was there, and I don't remember anyone else, frankly. Yeah, one thing I was thinking about is. Uh, when we talk about art education and for, you know all these things, as I I stumbled upon, of course, you know people that they showed me the work and it was work that would have been a lot of the work that was championed by John is stuff that I had been told about, you know, from Weston to Friedlander to Dean Arbus to everybody else. But um, maybe because I wasn't in New York, being in Boston at the Museum School and uh, when I was in North Carolina at, at School of the Arts. I never heard John's name. I certainly didn't hear about him as a photographer. And, um, but I do think there's something to this idea of legacy of putting work out into the universe. Like I said, by looking at those three books this morning, um, I was in, it was inspiring in this indirect kind of way. I mean, the, the way of his language, the way of some of the photographs, of course, but even just thinking about, he talks about going to when he was working in Chicago, he's trying to, you know, to make money, he was assisting these commercial photographers and uh, having the realization that 
he did not want to be a commercial photographer. A, it was a lot of work, and B, just you know, if, to make photographs for money as the as the end result wasn't something uh, that he was interested in. And I don't know. Whenever you read those sorts of things of people that have come before that are uh, that you you know paid a price and and went through and made these sorts of decisions, it's kind of reassuring to be reminded of uh, that kind of engagement with you know, being an artist or being a creative person. And um, so, you know, there's the legacy of his curatorial work and, and maybe, I, I think it's probably as, as little as his name got brought up as someone to pay attention to when I was in art school in the 90s. I know I've been at the, uh, the Forum for Contemporary Photography at MoMA that they hold um, every like a couple times a year. I've been to events uh, where they're talking about the history of curation. They're talking about all these things about the, the how photography has been talked about. And even at MoMA, they don't mention his name unless, you know, someone just happens to mention it in passing. Uh, so it's kind of nice that there's this possibility of the written word and that these things are out there and that, uh, as he said at the end of that, that quote at the end of his obituary, you know, maybe people will stumble, stumble upon these things later. So it's a good reason to get your work out in the world and, uh, and hope that it finds resonance with somebody later, if not the person that you thought it would be at the time. All right, uh, we're just at the one hour mark. Anyone else have something they want to add? Hi, I think you did a great job presenting him as a photographer, but it's hard to ignore his curatorial and writing legacy. When personally, I still use his, you know, looking at photographs as uh, inspiration for an assignment that I give every month, every semester. And the text from Mirrors and Windows is just a wonderful, you know, introduction and, and what is American photography in the middle of the 20th century. So, uh, but, you know, thank you again. Yeah, yeah. I think the, the thing that, that stands out is how much of art and fame and notoriety and influence are all linked to fashion and of a time and how much it's cyclical and how many artists and, and people of some note, repute or power go in and out of influence at a pretty good cycle, pretty rapidly. If you think from him at the, at the apotheosis of power in the world of photographic art to um, hardly remembered, pretty amazing in not a lot of time. For sure. Uh, Amanda, did you have something you want to add? Yeah. Just something really quickly. Um, I definitely need to read a few of his books because I'd be interested in his point of view, especially on architecture. Um, and I can definitely see influence on someone like myself who is a millennial and living in New York and just being surrounded by all of these historical skyscrapers and monumental buildings and just seeing how um, the skyline is changing um, every year. The skyscrapers just get bigger and bigger and taller and taller. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely will be looking more into his work and, and how it relates to architecture. Yeah, you might also want to look up that uh, Louis Sullivan kindergarten chats. Uh, it might not be as good as the waterfowl book that uh, Jeffrey mentioned, but it's, it sounds like it could be interesting. I, I, I forgot to mention is, you know, John also married an architect. His wife, Jill, was an architect. So there is a long standing kind of, you know, interest in architecture kind of uh, throughout his life. So that's definitely, definitely a theme that continues. Um, anybody else? Oh, Jeffrey, you're muted. We can't hear you. Yeah, I have to press it. I'm getting the idea now. Okay. It just, it's just a, a thought of turning everything upside down. And when I had to talk about him as a photographer at San Francisco MoMA, I realized that, in fact, it was his practice as a photographer that gave him such a, a strong position uh, as a curator. He, you, when you're a, a serious practitioner like him, you have a different language. And, uh, you know, I mean, Steichen, who pr pr preceded him, was also a photographer. But Ste Steichen had a huge ego. And he, he only, the only person who ever, he ever did a one-man show of at the museum was Edward Steichen. You know? So John got there 
and he, he resuscitated the history. It's not just Gary Winogrand, Arbus Freelander, and Walker Evans, who was in total decline when he did that show in 19, 1971. He also brought back or rediscovered Bill Brandt, um, Andre Cartes, um, Brassai, and he discovered um, Jacques-Henri Latigue, you know, the completely unknown French childhood photographer. Um, but he, he, was, he, was, he was always a photographer. And he, you know, he would, I don't know whether this story is true, but when, when Arbus went to show him pictures, he brought out, a, uh, the first time he brought out a box of prints by August Sanders. said, look at these, you know, you might learn something. And I, I really think that you, it's very hard to separate the two, even though he gave it up. That's my point. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, there's no doubt that his, his, him being a photographer and then that he could then recognize not even just the people that he felt a, a, a companionship in terms of artistic practice, but even just the realization of what it took to make the work when he would see the work, you know, you know what it takes to make that. And um, I do feel like these days, I mean, some of the curators and some of the museums now I think aren't even particularly interested in photography so much as they are in other things. So, you know, certainly not in what it takes to go out and make a photograph. And uh, yeah, so something is lost uh, when that kind of part of the conversation disappears and when everything becomes post photography or when everything that, um, you know, people things that are just barely, barely connected to the idea of what, me, what is a photographic practice somehow become, oh, that's photography too, because it's a selection, or that's photography too, because, you know, X, Y, or Z, tangential reason, right? So, yeah, hopefully more, more people, maybe more photographers will be willing to uh, give it up. But of course, you know, that's why I think so many people have also got into uh, putting on works of the friends of theirs is because of this idea of wanting to, you know, take that mantle on and, and, and be able to promote work of photographers who they think are on the, on the same path, maybe. All right, uh, we're just over an hour, so uh, I'm going to wrap it up unless someone had anything else that they desperately wanted to add to the conversation. Great. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much for coming in and uh, and uh, listening to uh, me ramble on about John. I do think he's in. Think he's in. So, everyone, take care and uh, maybe go apply for unemployment, as RJS mentioned. That's money. <laughs>